Uh, good morning, everyone. Very good morning. Very nice to see you. Very warm welcome to our service this morning. If we've not met before, everyone calls me Leddy. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, lots of people are away, of course, on summer holidays. Lots of people are visiting. And so very warm welcome if you're here for the first time uh, at Dundonald. Uh, very warm welcome, too, if you're joining us uh, online. Great to be together. We're all staying together for our service today. We call it All In. That means all ages, all together. There is an unmanned creche for those under reception, if that would be helpful. Uh, so do uh, make use of that if you're under reception age. Through the back doors is the place to head. We'll be giving packs out uh, for children uh, a little later on in the service to help you think about what we're learning in God's word. We're thinking this summer about some psalms. We're thinking today about Psalm 51 that reminds us that whilst we are sinful, we fall short, well short of God's standards. But God is so kind and so loving that he restores us and forgives us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing his praises in a moment. But before we do that, let me read some words from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies, thank you, that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He's so awesome. And we're going to hear more about that today. Let me pray. Father God, thank you that you are so good, so kind, so loving, so awesome. Your power is so great. And we really want to get to know you better today. Not just in our heads, but in our hearts, our souls, our whole being. So that we worship you and live for you now and always. Amen. Let's stand together to sing praise to this awesome God.
song has some actions but we don't have anyone that knows them um, so feel free to make them up I think it's something about Rupert running really fast um, so if you can visualize that and you want to run really fast go for it we're gonna celebrate the gospel that we want to go and share with everyone because it's such good news has risen, he has been given all authority to rule the world. No one is higher than the Messiah. Sending us to go. Go. 
sons and daughters Wash them with water In the name of Father, Spirit, Son We take salvation To every nation Worshipping the Lord, the Lord who Please do stay standing. We've made a note of everyone who did the action, so next time we need some people, we're <laughs> going to call you all up front. Well done. What a good song. Let me pray as we stand. <laughs> Father God, we want so many more people to hear the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've uh, allowed us to hear it and believe it, and we want more and more people to hear it and believe it too, so please help us to go and make disciples of all nations, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Please do sit down, and uh, Mark Vernon has come in with some exciting things happening in the month of August. Uh, well, that song's a great introduction to this ministry focus slot. Um, if a church isn't sending, it's ending. How do you feel about that? That was one of the controversial statements of the last... Bible study session we did. Um, I wonder what discussion it provoked in your group. If a church isn't sending, it's ending. Um, then we had a follow-up question. How outward looking are we as a church or a small group? What would be one step we could take to grow in this area together? Well, I've got some suggestions for you. I don't know how you answered that in your small group. I've already heard that some of the KG groups from the evening congregation have asked to be linked to a mission partner so they can get to know them better and pray more effectively. Here's another suggestion. It involves Wednesday evenings in August. We've called them Global Focus. Uh, so three Wednesday evenings in August. Each one will hear from one of our mission partners, not just for the prayer requests. We often do that, but we're actually going to hear them teaching the Bible uh, to us. They'll give a short talk on a psalm. We'll hear an update on the ministry, and then we'll pray for them. We tried this out last August uh, and uh, people really enjoyed it, particularly hearing from these mission partners who we actually support to do Bible teaching 
We just don't often hear them do it ourselves. Um, so on Wednesday, the 9th of August, Donald Camacy is going to be coming to speak on Psalm 73 and also tell us about his work with Predica Vida, um, which means preach life, apparently, in Mexico. He works in Mexico, teaching and training Bible teachers there. It'd be a great encouragement to him uh, if we had a good crowd on Wednesday, the 9th of August. He'll be here in person. On the 16th, we hear from Determine, our friend from Word Increase Ministries in Rwanda. Um, and on the 23rd of August, uh, from our good friend, Adriano Mbaki, uh, who teaches at Servants of the Word in the Gambia. So we'll get a taste of Mexico, of East Africa, and of West Africa. That's not a bad summer holiday. Um, hope to see you there. Uh, one thing we can do to keep our global focus during August. Thanks. Let us pray, starting with some verses from Psalm 66. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Father God, we praise and glorify your wonderful name as we come before you in great reverence and awe. Thank you that we see the reflection of your character in all the beauty of your creation and take delight in the variety and complexity of all that you have made. As we consider all that you have done in revealing yourself to us through the scriptures, we praise and thank you especially for the wonderful gift of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. Thank you that through his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection, he has defeated our greatest enemies. Thank you that by believing and trusting in him, we can have eternal life with you. We long for the time when he will return in great glory and power, and every knee shall bow before him and confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. To the praise of your glory, amen. Father God, we thank you for this lovely holiday season when families and friends can enjoy restful time together and a break from the usual routine. We praise you for so many youngsters attending camps across the country and pray that they and the leaders will have been encouraged, built up in their faith and drawn closer to you through all they have been learning. We pray for the Global Focus Evenings here in August when three of our mission partners will give short talks on a psalm and update us on their ministry. We pray that many people would attend, be encouraged to hear of gospel outreach across the world and be led to enjoy supporting our mission partners more wholeheartedly. We pray for all the planning and preparation for the holiday at home for retired people at the end of August. Please provide a good team of helpers. Bless their interaction with guests to be good witnesses for the gospel and grant good attendance throughout the week. We pray that you would open the hearts and minds of guests as they hear the Bible talks. Help them understand the truth of who the Lord Jesus is, that they may claim him as their own Lord and Saviour. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father God, we praise you for the Options Crisis Pregnancy Centre and for all the support they receive from Dundonald and other churches, providing a meeting space for clients and for all the hard-working volunteers. We pray that Options would continue to honour God in its work and that those in crisis would turn to places like Options for help. We ask that the rebranding exercise would be successful and effective in connecting with clients who need support. We pray that for each client, this would be the start of a journey of discovering your mercy and loving kindness in the gospel.
In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Finally, Father, we bring before you now all those we know and love who are unwell, facing difficult times, suffering pain or bereavement. As we have been reminded by our studies in Ezra, we know you are faithful in lovingly bringing us through times of suffering if we depend and trust in you. Please, therefore, help our loved ones to put their trust in you and comfort them through these hard times. Please give us teachable hearts now as we come to hear your word and help us to obey your rule in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together, which should be on the screen behind me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, just before we have our Bible reading, it's time for children to have their packs. Now is the time, uh, if you would like to make use of the unmanned creche, if you're under reception. These packs are for those in reception through to year six. And uh, if you'd like one of these packs, do just put your hand up and the stewards will bring it to you. Let me just point out, while it's coming round, one of the beauties is, uh, in this pack, not just a lollipop and some colouring pencils, but this brilliant little booklet that will help you Think about what we're learning from Psalm 51. There are things to colour in, there's a word search, and there's a little question and uh, answers, a little quiz, to help you learn more about Jesus from Psalm 51. So if you're in your reception to year six and you'd like a pack, stick your hand up. If you're over 35 and you've got your hand up, then uh, that's probably a bit too old. Um, why not turn to the person next to you and chat for a couple of minutes uh, while the packs are being distributed, and then we'll come back together in a second for our Bible reading. Okay, let's come out together. Who's eaten their lolly already? Uh, we're going to have our Bible reading now, and uh, Elizabeth is going to come and read it for us. Thank you. There are two Bible readings this morning, so you might like to um, find both of them before I start reading. The first one is from 2 Samuel chapter 12, which can be found on page 315 of the church Bibles. So 2 Samuel chapter 12, page 315. And the second reading is from Psalm 51 which can be found on page 573 of your Bibles. So 
So 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And now Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear your joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Good morning, everybody. Most of you, I don't think, will have a clue who I am. Some of you will. I used to be a pastor here a number of years ago. I think it was 13 Mark Vernon and I were calculating earlier. Um, I currently work in an office upstairs uh, for a couple of Christian charities, so I'm around. Uh, It's nice to see some old faces. Um, Kids, you've got this little pack here. Um, Mine says I got an A star on it. I did. Uh, My colouring was that good. Um, Kate Horrible and I did spend about 20 minutes on the spot the eight differences. It is virtually impossible. Um, So give it a go. Uh, And if you manage to complete it by the end, um, I'm sure I can find a prize for you for the best one. 
Shall we pray there as we begin? Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, these are weighty words, and some of us are feeling the weight of them right now. And yet also we probably hear the whispers of the evil one who is trying to say, don't listen. We all need to hear this, and we all need to examine our, each of our own hearts so that we might know that joy and gladness we've heard of in verse 8. Please work in us, I pray, through your word and by your spirit. Amen. The Bible describes uh, King David as a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel. But as we've seen uh, in our first reading, that man was brought to utter ruin by letting his eyes linger when he should have been elsewhere. None of us, male, female, young or old, are beyond falling as we've seen David fall. In fact, we are probably more likely to fall like David because of who we are here. We are sophisticated, we are educated, many of us, we are wealthy. We have power in that sense. David was a great sinner, but he was probably the most rich and powerful man at that time. And therefore, like us, he was able to cover up. Well, so he thought. And we heard, didn't we, in, in that chapter in 2 Samuel, that God knew and God exposed. He used Nathan to say, you are that man. Please note, therefore, that wealth and power is no match for God. The weight and the dirtiness and the consequences of David's sin are what led him to sing this song, to write this song. You see that in the superscription, the verse naught, the bit in italics. It's part of scripture. It's there at the beginning of Psalm 51 for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And so we see here in Psalm 51, him crying out to God. Look at the depth of the language he uses. Verse 2, wash me, cleanse me. My sin is ever before me. Now, we're going to spend two weeks digging into this psalm, this week and next week. Why? Because I want us to feel the weight of it, the weight of our sin. I want us to, so we can sing the great hymn, the best known hymn, and really know that we are wretches. To feel that, to believe that, and understand that we are totally undeserving of any mercy and forgiveness of God. Because only then, only then when we're brought so low can we enjoy the thrill, the freedom of being lifted up in the mercy and the abundant grace of God. You know the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved Day. Yeah? Are you? Do you feel that? You see, so often we miss out on the joy, the liberating joy, because we default to how the world deals with sin. We see it everywhere. Politicians are great at it in our workplaces. I'm sure it happens in our own lives and sadly even in churches. We all do it. And the more sophisticated, the more educated, the more wealthy we are, just like David, the more danger we are in because we default to that denial and cover-up, rather than going to the liberating joy of confessing and knowing God's mercy and forgiveness. Why do we do that? Well, probably at the root of it is pride, isn't it? Pride can convince us, oh, we're not really that bad. Look at those people over there. Pride relativizes our sin, doesn't it? And it can push us to try and control the narrative because we don't want to look, do we, like particularly to our neighbors and those we go to school with and so on, we don't want to look like the lost wretch, do we? So rather than honestly coming before the Lord, saying sorry, seeking forgiveness, what do we do? We cover up, we deny, we shift blame. We say, I only did it because they provoked me. It's really their fault. We become the entitled victim rather than the honest perpetrator who needs to confess. 
And let me tell you, that is a joyless existence. So please don't miss out as we dig into this psalm on the joy that is on offer. Three things, very quickly, hopefully. We're going to see the desperation of confession, the honesty of confession, and thirdly, the joy of confession. Let's dive in. Uh, Look at the desperation firstly in verse 1 and 2. Did you note, uh, well, you probably didn't because we didn't read the chapter, but if you go to it later, uh, 2 Samuel uh, 11, David breaks four of the last five commandments in that chapter alone. Covetousness, theft, murder, adultery. He couldn't acknowledge it, though. And so God employs Nathan, doesn't he, to confront him. And only then does David stop the cover-up and begin that road to joy. David needed Nathan. He couldn't see the depths of his sin. He couldn't acknowledge it. And none of us can. And that is why God graciously gives us brothers and sisters to point it out in us. Oh, it's painful, isn't it? But we need it. And when sin is exposed in our lives, yes, with dollop loads of gentleness and love, uh, it is that road to joy that we'll see in this psalm. David is confronted with the horrible reality of who he is. Look look in in verse 1 as he cries out, Have mercy on me, O God. Who is David appealing to there? He doesn't ask God to forgive him or show his mercy to him on the basis of who he is or anything that he has done. He doesn't appeal to God as saying, oh, I've suffered so much. And David had since 2 Samuel. His son had died. Absalom and his other son had rebelled against him. Part of his kingdom had rebelled against him as well in Sheba. He doesn't appeal on the basis of that. And he doesn't appeal on the basis of saying, you know, I've learned my lesson, Lord. I promise I'll never sin again like that. No, he knows his present heart. He knows what it'd be like in the future. And so any appeal to God's mercy on that basis would be totally fraudulent, as it would for any of us. No, David cries out to God, knowing he deserves absolutely nothing apart from God's discipline and God's justice. But he instinctively does the right thing. Look what he does. He reaches into the depths of God's grace. Have mercy on my God. According to your unfailing love. Or it's, it's actually the abundant word. It's an abundant hesed or loving covenant kindness. It's that loyal love which is shown throughout scripture. You've seen it in Ezra recently. Uh, the first use of it was back in Exodus 32. You remember the golden calf incident? There God's people have been total idiots. And, and, and the Lord says to Moses, he says, let me, have a, let me out these people that I might, my wrath might burn against them. And, and Moses appeals to the Lord, and the Lord relents in his covenant love. And it is that love which David is appealing to now. So first, he appeals to God's unfailing love. Secondly, he appeals to, look at the end of verse 1, according to your great or abundant, again, same word, his great compassion. There is a double abundance here in verse 1. Even better than the double bacon Big Mac that's on offer right now. Has anyone seen that? Oh, if you've eaten that, good luck to you. Wow. Abundant love, abundant compassion. And here in that compassion, we see something of God's love for his children. Parents, we have compassion on our children. We're willing to go without so much in order to, to, for the well-being of our children. And here... David is in utter disgrace. Where can he turn? God's abundant love and God's abundant compassion for his children. Why? Because he's seen it in salvation history. That compassion worked out again and again. But he also feels and sees his desperate need for forgiveness. He knows the true depths of his sin. And we see that. Look how he describes it. Look at the language he uses for sin in verse 1. Three words, transgressions, firstly. Is that heart and mind, willful disobedience. Iniquity, second word. Sometimes it describes a deviation from the right path. 
And third word used is sin. It's the catch-all phrase, if you like, at the end, just in case we feel we missed anything out. And that's the moral, ethical missing of a standard of God. Kids, middle page, it says, what is sin? What is it? Do you remember how Tash sometimes describes this? Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rule. You see it? All is revealed here. He doesn't minimize, he doesn't relativize or deflect. He knows and he feels the depths of his sin and the forgiveness that he requires. Look at the vivid language now to to see how he knows he needs to be forgiven. Blot out, wash me, cleanse me. That wash me language is often used that when a garment was really stained, if you've ever had kids and they played rugby, you know what I'm talking about here. You know, like it's totally trodden in, so much so that you have to rub soap in it and then you have to beat it, you have to pummel it to get that stain out. Sin is the soiled fabric of our souls. Ground in. Such that we need to be scrubbed clean by God's mercy and grace. And we know our hearts, don't we? We know the messy sin that entangles in each of our lives. We know the weight of it. We feel the weight of it before a holy God. Can I just suggest, just five seconds, just for a moment, in the quietness of your heart, consider your sin, probably the stuff that no one knows about. And just look at verse one and two, perhaps pray it for you personally. 10 seconds. Hey, do you see, and more importantly, do you feel the desperation of confession? Don't delude yourself to think that you can cover up or deal with your own sin. We are all, as we're about to sing later, prone to wonder. And Lord, do we really feel it? I guess we do, don't we? And so this is the start of the journey, isn't it? The joy of forgiveness begins with this urgent, desperate confession before the only one who can forgive. So firstly, the desperation of confession. Secondly, the honesty of confession. Verse 3 down uh, through to verse 9. Look at it. There are no excuses. David owns it, verse 3. For I know my transgressions, he says, and my sin is always before me. What he's saying is that, you know, when you sin, it kind of lingers in your sight, doesn't it? You, you close your eyes in bed at night and it's there. It lingers. You can't get rid of it. It's seared into our hearts and minds. And even worse, verse 4, look, against you, you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. Sin is ultimately, you see, against God. Oh, of course, David had sinned against Uriah. That's Bathsheba's husband. You know, in taking her, uh, he'd sinned against Bathsheba herself. Of course he had. But all our sin is ultimately against God. It is, one scholar put it, God's presence forgotten. It's that shove off God. God's holiness is outraged. He's saying, I'm in charge, not you, the holy God. And it's God's love scorned. No to your rule. And David's prayer here, it's not some kind of therapeutic rant to get off his chest. It's a warning to us all. Sin, our sin, is ultimately against God and his judgment of it will be right and it will be fair. Look how David expresses that. Halfway through verse four, you're right in your verdict. You're justified when you judge. Now, it's interesting. David doesn't specify any of his sin with Bathsheba. So why? That's really good for us because we can sing this song too. This is more about David's, him being kind of a lifelong sinner. Look at verse five. He says, Surely, at the, the original word there is, behold, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, David isn't critiquing his mum here or any kind of intimate union within marriage. No, he's saying, no, I'm a vintage sinner. David is kind of going, I'm the cabinet serving you of, you know, kind of sinners. I'm so sophisticated. I've been doing the whole of my life. 
This isn't a one-off for him. He isn't excusing himself. He's saying no one else is to blame but him alone. He's just showing what we're like as a species. Kids, I wonder if any of you have had, um, when you got, got to school, you know, you have like topics. Have you ever had a topic about how to be naughty? You know, do they do that in preschool these days? I'm not sure. You know, reception classes. Before we start, you know, holding a pencil and doing the right thing, you know, let's just teach you how to sin. Kids, we don't, we don't do that, do we? You don't need to teach any of us how to sin. If you're a new mum and a new dad here, you, it might take you a while, and all the older parents will chuckle internally at this moment, uh, but, but it will soon come. The cute and cuddly bundle of joy that you hold is a sinful wretch that will push every button that you have within you and push you to your utter limits for 18 or more years. We love them. We cherish them. They're a wonderful blessing, but boy, do they push you. They are sinners. Do you see the scale of the problem? A change of lifestyle, a a more, more discipline for David or any of us is not the solution But you see David's honesty about his sin here. Now, his honesty continues. It slightly flips here halfway through. Uh, Now the solution comes into focus. And what is the solution that he proposes here? God's forgiveness deals with the justice our sin deserves. But what about the future? And the solution comes into focus. It is our hearts. We need complete restoration, complete renewal. Do you see the turn in the song? As I said, at the beginning of verse 5, in the original, the word is behold. It's not great in our translation. It's surely here. Um, And he's he's kind of showing, that is my behold. That's what I'm like as a sinner, he's saying. That's kind of the closing of that part. And then the same word appears in the original at the beginning of verse 6. Behold, to contrast David's confession with God's desire for the sinner. So verse six, behold, it's behold, you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. We've got a double behold there, verse five, verse six. Behold the lifelong singer, verse five. Behold what God desires for the lifelong singer, sinner, verse six. And what does God desire? Faithfulness or truth even about the stuff that no one knows about. And where do we find that truth to be faithful? Well, it's on your laps. You're holding in your hands. It's in God's word. And this isn't, about, this isn't just truth about what's on show. This is truth, as you see, in the secret place. It's the behind closed doors stuff of your life. Now, it's interesting, the tenses of the verbs in, in verse 6 to 8, uh, we have them as you taught me, you cleansed me, you, and so on. But they are future tenses, older translations, older folks, you remember this. Uh, do you remember, I, I grew up with this, it's thou shalt teach me, thou shalt cleanse me, thou shalt let me. And do you see what David is doing here as he cries out to God? He's saying, in your unfailing love and mercy, please, 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 will you? Teach me, cleanse me, and so on. And do you see the point? Nothing in verse 6 to 8 is about what David can do or what you and I can do. It's all about what God can do. The cleanse language is literally to de-sin. The wash language comes from temple and tabernacle kind of language as ceremonial washing. And each line in verse 6 to 8 builds on the other. It's Hebrew poetry. It's called parallelism. It, 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 it's just showing us that nothing here is what we can do. It's, it's a human possibility. Only God can do this for us. But look at the hope, verse 7. Cleanse me with his hope. And what? I will be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. You, me, whiter than snow. With all that weight of guilt and shame, the overthinking, what can it be replaced with? Verse 8, joy and gladness. And remember, these are future verbs, future tense. So it should, literally should be read, God will you 
Fill me with joy and gladness. Take a step back for a moment. Just look at the big picture here. Look at the completeness of God's restoring forgiveness. He can wash you and me clean. Not an off-white kind of nice beige from Farrenball. Farrenball's like a posh paint place, isn't it? There's one up at Wimbledon Village. I cycle past it, can't afford it, but there we go. You know, it makes these very nice colors that you put on your walls at home. Now, your life, it might look like a nicely painted Farrenball off-white. And everyone goes, oh, yes. Nice shade of duck egg, whatever. You might be so presentable to the world around you. But please, in our middle class arrogance, let's not think that our sin is presentable. And neglect our desperate need for God's mercy and forgiveness. And likewise, equally in our arrogance and self-sufficiency, let's not think that we are too sinful, too grubby. We've done too much that God won't forgive us. Look at what is on offer here, verse 7. I shall be clean, wash whiter than snow. Joy and gladness, if you've, if you've wallowed in sin and you're struggling so much, joy and gladness can feel like such a distant memory, can't it? With no sight of hope on the horizon. Friends, however hard, however hard life is or whatever you've done, You can stand here today before God and he is doubly abundant in his love and his mercy. Behold your sin and behold him. He longs to make you clean and wash you whiter than snow. And when he does, joy and gladness, verse eight. Look how David concludes. He he kind of ends first half of the psalm here in verse nine. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. It's purposely mirroring verse one. There's lots of repeated language. You should go through the psalm, and it's kind of a bookend. Here's the end of the first half. But coming before God's face, biblically, should be a blessing. But David is landing this first half of the psalm with a bit of a reality check for you and me. Sin makes us rightful objects of God's judgment. His burning gaze, hence why David says, hide your face. David has prayed for mercy and forgiveness, but what about the future? Well, our final three verses this morning really focus that way. Look at verse 10, and 12, 10 through to 12. What's going on here? Well, David, is, he's refused to gloss over his sin and to settle back into old ways. He knows his weakness For him, it was women in baths on on, uh, kind of roofs. Uh, So he doesn't just look for the quick fix. Rather, now he asks for God to replace old for new. He's appealed for God's forgiveness, but look what he goes for now. Verse 10, God's power. Verse 11, God's presence. Verse 12, God's pleasure. And as we seek these things, and then and then only, might we know the And our final point this morning, the joy of salvation. The joy of salvation. If you're anything like me, so often you deceive yourself, don't you? You're thinking, well, if I dare confess, even before the Lord or before another, it's just going to make my life so much worse. I'm going to despair all the more if I dare to confess. It's counterintuitive, but the opposite is true. Sin suppressed is delight destroyed. And that is true in any loving relationship. If you dare to be honest, if you dare to be vulnerable with those you love, and and they won't hold it against you, the the despair that you feel, and it does come as you uh, kind of open up that you're vulnerable, what does that despair bring? What does it lead to? It's a beautiful, joyful intimacy. If you're married here, and I know many of you are, Have you ever told your spouse something you're perhaps ashamed of, that you've done, that you're struggling with? Perhaps you're struggling with pride or envy. That's big stuff for SW19, isn't it? Have you only had three extensions on your house? Envy. 
pride. It gets everywhere. Or perhaps it's anger. Perhaps it's lust. Let's be honest, we all struggle, don't we? There's nothing more beautiful, isn't it, than confessing to someone and them responding to you with love. I've got you. Let me give you a hug. Let's pray about this and let's walk through this together. Because that displays God's grace more than anything else. A million times more amazing though, David tells his Lord here, the depths of his mucky sin, he begins in despair, but resting in that limitless love of God, look where he goes. To restoration. And we see that in verse 10. David prays, look, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. David's not muted here. He's not ashamed. He knows his loving Lord. And what he's asking for is an absolute miracle here. That create word at the beginning of verse 10 is the same create word we get in Genesis 1. Look at David's humility, though. Before he was covering his sin, and now he knows he is broken, and even this great king could do nothing to renew himself. So firstly then, David prays for God's creating power. Secondly, he prays for God's intimate presence. Look at verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now this side of the cross, you ought to be careful here. In God's mercy... Our sin doesn't separate us from God. God won't take his Holy Spirit from the repentant believer. But this is warning language that should not be ignored. Repentant, unconfessed sin might reveal in you that you do not know the Lord at all. And so hear the warning. Turn and fall into the doubly abundant love of God. David pleads to be close, knowing God's loving presence. Lastly, look at it. He prays for seeking God's pleasure, joy in salvation. Verse 12, restore restore to me the joy of salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David asked God to deliver him and in delivering him, joy is restored and it is all a work of God's spirit in David's spirit. David asks the spirit to renew, to not be removed, verse 11, and now to sustain in verse 12. If you picture it, David's kind of like on the ground, isn't he? Because of his sin, it's taken him down and the only one who can scrape him off the floor is the Lord. If you are a believer here today, don't miss out on that creating, renewing, restoring work of God. We've all sinned, haven't we? We all fallen short, Romans 3 tells us. We all have sin that entangles in our lives. We all try and cover up to varying degrees. We're all ashamed. We all feel the weight of guilt as we stand before a holy, perfect God. None of us would say to our friends, oh, look at me, I'm whiter than snow. Because we don't feel like that so often. But we all long for it. So how do we get it? How can we be whiter than snow? See, despite your desperate need, we must be honest. Come before the Lord, even about your secret places. Come before our doubly abundant Lord as he longs to forgive and restore. Now, how can we be sure that he will wash us whiter than snow? It's the most simple Sunday school answer, and his name is Jesus. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he was crushed for our iniquities. He took on himself our dirty sins so that we could be washed whiter than snow. His perfect righteousness counted as ours so that we are clean. He was cast from his father's loving presence. Why? So that we could be know, we could know for eternity his father's loving embrace. And through faith in Jesus, you can stand here today. We can, forgiven, filled with joy and gladness. Look, your houses might not have the best fire and ball paint on the walls. 
Your job might be so dull that you're just terrified about tomorrow. Your marriage might be a great struggle. You might be fighting a sin and feeling so rubbish about it right now. Look, newsflash, we all are, okay? In varying ways. Be honest about your sin. And if someone is honest about their sin with you today, don't be surprised. Don't, really? Receive it with the double abundance that you see of Psalm 51. Get help if needed. And walk with that individual, your brother and sister in Christ. You are a wretch. They are a wretch. But Jesus took on all of our wretchedness so that we can stand here today whiter than snow. The devil is probably whispering in all of our ears right now, oh, ignore that. Just deal with it yourself. You're doing quite well at covering it up. Don't worry. I remember an old hymn as I was a kid. It said this, What though the vile accuser roar of sins that I have done, I know them well and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none. Why? Because as Jesus has paid for them all. Because in Christ we can be whiter than snow. Last thing before I close. This is a song. Do you spot that? It's a corporate song as well. It's, been, it's designed and God has sovereignly put it in his word for us to sing together. We confess together. Why? Because we need each other. We need a Nathan. Church family is not church family if we can't be truly honest and vulnerable. And if we dare to do that, we'll begin to see the true beauty and the joy and gladness of the gospel. So three things. The desperation of confession. Do you feel it? The honesty of confession. Don't cover up. Thirdly, the joy of confession. Don't miss out on the joy and gladness on offer in Jesus Christ. And only when that weight of sin is lifted can we truly begin to see the weight of glory that we can know in him. That is the pathway to joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if the devil is whispering in our ears, please help us to fight him. Help us to say, shove off. Please, by your spirit and through your words that we just unpack now, please work in each of us that we might know that joy and gladness that we know in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we sing together, uh, we're going to spend a few moments just praying this prayer of confession together. We've thought about it, we've heard it, we've been convicted by God's Holy Spirit. And so uh, before we say the words of Psalm 51 together, they'll be on the screen. Before we say this prayer together, uh, let's have a moment of quiet. You might like to bring before the Lord something that he's been personally challenging you with, confident that Jesus blood has covered and paid for all that sin to wash you clean. Let's have a moment of quiet before we pray together. Let's pray Psalm 51 as a prayer of confession together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, 
You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his sinless, perfect life. Thank you that he was cast from your presence on the cross so that we might be welcomed by you for all eternity. Thank you that in him all of our sins, past, present and future, whatever we've done, are blotted out by you. We thank you, Father. And we pray, Father, that you would restore us to the joy of your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final song is also a prayer, a prayer that uh, asks God to bind our wandering hearts to him. It's also a reminder. Uh, uh, it's one of my favourite verses, this. Uh, oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Clothed then in the blood-washed linen, how I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Let's stand together to sing. Two. 
Here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. seats. Whenever we hear God's word, it's a little bit like a scalpel. It diagnoses our problem and that's painful, but it's also wonderful because it leads us towards the solution and the cure in the Lord Jesus. Uh, Before you uh, might want to head off to tea or coffee or maybe even run around and play with friends, you might like to pray quietly either on your own or with somebody in response to what we've heard this morning. If you want to come and find Andy or I, we'd be very glad to chat or pray or chat or pray with one another as we apply God's word to our hearts and our lives. Uh, just a reminder, it's our monthly prayer meeting on uh, Wednesday uh, here at 8 o'clock. Uh, so do um, come if you're able to on Wednesday. Before we close, let me read some words that we heard from Psalm 51 before I pray. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Father, we pray those things for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for our loved ones. And for this world, Father, please would you restore us to the joy of the salvation we have in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.